Uh, my collaborators, so Dora Matsky and her student Charlotte Tennis, are at the University of Amsterdam, and Andrew Heathcote, who's currently at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Um, these are folks that I've worked with previously on uh, other projects involved in modeling other stop signal tasks, and they've been involved in developing novel methods for um, modeling this paradigm specifically. And some of those methods ended up being really, really helpful when we were thinking about how to address some of the specific issues with the ABCD task. So a lot of folks here are probably somewhat familiar with the stop signal task. It's a very common uh, task-based paradigm for measuring inhibitory control in both clinical uh, research and cognitive neuroscience. Um, basically in this task, participants complete a choice task, but they have to inhibit their response on a subset of trials following a stop signal, which is typically in the classic paradigm an auditory tone. So typically this uh, choice task is fairly simple, like just deciding whether an X or an O is presented on the screen in the classic paradigm. Um, but then on the subset of stop trials, after what's called a stop signal delay, um, which is a variable delay that's usually determined by a participant's um, uh, performance on the task, um, where longer delays are typically uh, more difficult. So you kind of, it's typically titrated to make sure that there's about a 50% probability of a person inhibiting their response on the task. Um, so after these delays, there's a stop signal. Um, this makes it um, a very challenging task in some ways because uh, typically the person has uh, already been processing the stimulus for some time and is for in the process of forming their response and now they have to stop that response. Um, so most commonly this task is used to estimate what's called the stop signal reaction time, um, which is one of the most commonly used individual difference measures uh, of inhibitory control in the literature, at least in terms of task-based measures. So to understand where SSRT comes from, we have to talk about the horse race model, which is this traditional model that uh, um, was um, proposed by Logan to explain performance on the task. Um, and basically this idea is that um, on stop trials in this task, there is a race between a go process that onsets at the time of the go stimulus and a stop process that onsets um, at the time of the stop signal. That, the idea is that these processes race over time. And if the go process wins, the participant fails to inhibit their response, but if the stop process wins, they're able to inhibit it. Um, so we can use some, under the assumptions of this model, we can use some information uh, uh, from this task to try and estimate the SSRT. Um, so typically we'd be looking at probability of inhibition across different stop signal delays and the different latencies of these delays. So like I said, these delays are typically titrated um, based on the participant's performance to try and kind of find the region where the person has a roughly 50% chance of inhibiting their response on the task. Um, so once we know the stop signal delay at which uh, the person has about a 50% probability of responding, we can also look at the finishing times of the go process, which we're inferring via go trial RT. So I want you to keep this in mind because it becomes important when we're talking about um, the ABCD task in particular. So the idea is that once you kind of uh, roughly know this SSD, um, at which there's a 50% probability of responding and know uh, the average finishing time of the go process, you can take the difference between these two um, to compute the SSRT. So there's, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but conceptually this is what um, we're doing. So if you look at the design of the ABCD task, in a lot of ways, it's a fairly typical stop task. So there's a queue. Participants have to decide whether this arrow is pointing to the left or to the right. On stop trials, they'll see um, after the stop signal delay an upward facing arrow that indicates to them that they have to inhibit their response. Um, and like a lot of stop tasks, there's that titration process where you try and um, uh, modify the SSD based on the participant's performance. So like I said, in a lot of ways, this is fairly typical, but one major difference from um, a lot of other stop paradigms is that in this case, the visual stop signal completely masks the go stimulus. So when this upward facing arrow appears, the choice stimulus disappears and the participant doesn't have, can't continue to look at that uh, choice stimulus while they're forming their response. And this is important because it violates one of the key assumptions of the horse race model, which is known as context independence. Um, and this is the assumption that the choice process is going to have very similar properties in terms of response times and accuracy between go trials and stop trials. Um, so uh, Patrick Bissett, who's here, first kind of publicly pointed um, out that this uh, was a violation of context independence in the ABCD task. And they showed this plot, which is basically a, the smoking gun. It shows you that it's certainly violated here. Um, so this is a plot of accuracy rates on the choice task by SSD. And what you can see is that at zero millisecond SSDs where 
um, because of the design of the task, the participant doesn't actually see the choice stimulus at all. They just see the upward facing arrow because it's presented at the same time as the choice stimulus. As you would expect, accuracy is about chance. And then accuracy um, gradually increases over time as SSDs get longer and people get um, exposed to the choice stimulus for a longer period of time um, until it reaches an asymptotic value more similar to what it is on go trials around 300 or 400 milliseconds. Um, so this shows that context independence, at least with regards to accuracy, is violated here. Um, and they posit that, look, unless the ABCD community shows that this design issue does not distort conclusions, researchers should not use uh, the ABCD data set to es estimate SSRTs, which is really important because um, you know, this is a, a project that spent, uh, recruited about 11,000 uh, kids so far in a longitudinal study um, and spent a lot of time, effort, and money imaging them with this task. Um, so to understand why conduct independence violations can be really important, I want you to consider these two examples. So here in the example at the top where context independence is maintained, um, these bars here represent the latency of various processes. So here we're assuming that the choice process on Go trials, which is observed on Go trials, is the same latency as the choice process on stop trials. And in this case, we're correct in our assumption. So then to count, um, uh, estimate the SSRT, which also is unobserved on stop trials. What we'll do again is we'll want to take, uh, conceptually speaking, we want to basically take the difference between this SSD at which there's a 50% probability of the person responding um, and look at the difference between that and the choice process on Go trials. And then you get a pretty accurate estimate in this case of the SSRT. So contrast that with the um, example on the bottom where context independence is violated. So unbeknownst to us, uh, the choice process on stop trials is actually a good bit longer than the process on go trials. And then when we use the same procedure, we get a pretty significant underestimate of SSRT. So this shows that when context is independence is violated, especially with regard to the latency of the, of the go process, um, we can get some pretty, uh, pretty wrong conclusions about what um, SSRT is and can bias estimates in a meaningful way. So I want to back up a little bit, and, and some of you might be wondering at this point, why use a horse race model or another measurement model like this to measure performance in the first place? So these models, you know, um, have some assumptions that might be in some ways simplistic or might be finicky or not met in certain data sets. What's the big advantage that you get in kind of working within this framework? Um, so there's a lot of different processes that influence stop trial performance. Of course, there's um, the integrity of the inhibitory process. This is usually the process of interest that we're uh, measuring with this task. Um, but stop trial performance is also really influenced by an individual's processing efficiency, for example. So um, all other things being equal, somebody who's very, very fast at processing the go choice stimulus is actually gonna have a much more difficult time um, inhibiting the, um, their response um, at a given SSD compared to somebody who is slower at processing the Go stimulus because that Go process is just going to finish uh, more quickly. Um, so the trade-off between these two processes is really what the original horse race model does a, a really excellent job of addressing, right? Because we account for both um, on the task to get an estimate of someone's inhibitory ability. I also want to bring up this other process that's been of interest recently uh, in the field, and that's this idea of trigger failures. So going back to our example, the assumption here in the horse race model is that for a correct inhibit, the stop process finishes first and it wins, so the person is able to inhibit their response. Right in a failed inhibit, uh, the choice process finishes first and it wins. Um, so the idea is that behind trigger failures is that there could be on a subset of trials some instances here where the choice process wins, but it's because the stop process never even enters the race. And that's because potentially somebody didn't uh, uh, encode or, or notice or attend to um, the stop signal or for whatever reason just didn't generate this inhibitory process um, internally. And so it causes uh, basically failed inhibits for a reason that conceptually is pretty different from um, the failed inhibits that are assumed by the horse race model. And this is not accounted for by the horse race model. And the reason I bring these examples up is because it brings up a trade-off that I think we really need to be cognizant of when we're thinking of um, the ABCD tasks and model of this, models of this task. And that's this you know, inherent trade-off we see in modeling between model complexity and ease of use. So a simple horse race model is very easy to apply. Um, but it can account for processes that violate its assumptions or can't easily account for processes like trigger failures um, that were included in this, um, in this model. 
if you contrast this with a more complex model like the ex-Gaussian race model, so this is a model that Dora um, and Andrew have developed um, where basically you're not just trying to estimate the latency of the go and the stop process, you're actually fitting a model that tries to estimate um, the latency, the Gaussian variability, and the exponential variability of the entire distributions of the go and stop processes, right? Um, and so this model is clearly more complex. It makes it more difficult to apply. Sometimes estimating parameters of this model can be difficult. Um, but one bonus of having a model that has a richer description of the processes on the task is then you can start doing things like adding parameters that account for trigger failures because uh, a parameter that accounts for the probability of trigger failure on a given trial has some qualitatively different predictions than the parameters for the stop process. And so you can start to parse these things out. And this can be important. Um, so in this project where we looked at uh, children uh, with ADHD and some age-matched, uh, typically developing peers, um, we so the context of this is that there's this long literature on uh, stopping in ADHD where there's uh, replicated effects uh, using the horse race model of uh, longer SSRT um, in ADHD. This is a very common finding in the uh, um, interpretation is that there's an inhibitory deficit in the disorder, right? Um, so what we did here is we fit the ex-Gaussian race model and included uh, this parameter that accounts for trigger failures. And we found that one of the most salient differences between the groups was actually that kids with ADHD failed to trigger their, uh, tr failed to trigger the stop process about 30% of the time. Um, so this is a significant proportion of the time and it's almost uh, two to three times that of their peers. And we found that this is pretty consequential. So we did simulations here in the plot on the right, where we looked at the SSD50 difference, which is just kind of a summary measure of the um, of performance on uh, uh, the stop test and the difference between groups. Um, and basically what we found was that when we were able, we fixed various parameters, including the probability of trigger failure um, of the ADHD group to the parameters of the control group and then re-estimated this SSD50 difference, we found that we were basically able to eliminate the difference in stop trial performance with this trigger failure uh, parameter alone. Um, so this shows that in contrast to the wide literature, not necessarily using a model that accounts for trigger failures, we really think that this is the relevant process, at least when it comes to performance in ADHD. Um, and I bring this up to make a more general point, and that's that failing to account for unmodeled processes can have major consequences for inference. And so this is kind of how we're viewing, uh, how we think it's the most useful way to view this issue with the ABCD task, that the ABCD masking effect is currently an unmodeled process but it doesn't have to remain that way. So what our goals in this project were, were basically to try and develop a formal process model that explains the cognitive impact of the ABCD stop signal task masking effect on the go process. And in doing so, try and describe some key trends in the ABCD data. So we're most interested in describing this accuracy rate by um, uh, SSD effects, because this is kind of the smoking gun that shows that context independence is violated on the task. We're also interested in describing some more uh, features that are common to other stop signal tasks, like the inhibition function and signal respond RT slope. I'll go into what those are in a minute. Um, and if we're able to uh, create a model like that, what we want to do is use this model to quantify the functional impact of the ABCD task feature on horse race model inferences. So if we have a descriptive process model that can kind of account for this feature, we can see how biased um, the SSRT measurements from the traditional method are in ABCD. And then hopefully um, we can uh, evaluate whether this model can be actually used by researchers as a new measurement model. So if this model can describe the violation of context independence, um, can it be used then as a measurement model to account for that uh, so that research can get unbiased estimates of SSRT, trigger failures, and other processes that we might be interested in on this task. So these were our goals. So one thing that was really nice is that this is kind of an unprecedented issue to be dealing with in terms of um, uh, independence violation on a stop task, but we're not completely in the dark here. There's actually this really rich modeling literature already looking at um, how masking affects perceptual choice tasks. Um, so in the context of evidence accumulation models, these models basically explain masking effects 
um, as uh, reflecting the quality of visual short-term memory traces of stimuli. So evidence accumulation models basically assume that over time, when uh, somebody is given a perceptual choice test, they're gradually accumulating evidence, noisy evidence, for each response over time until um, that evidence reaches a critical threshold for one of the choices, and that choice is selected. And um, the idea here is that visual short-term memory traces decrease in quality when stimulus presentation times are shorter in a masking paradigm, um, which makes sense. If you um, uh, only see a stimulus for about 50 milliseconds, you have a pretty fuzzy trace of that stimulus in your mind's eye compared to if you got to see it for three or 400 milliseconds, right? Um, and the idea is that um, because of the decreased quality of these traces, the rate at which evidence accumulates for the true response um, in the evidence accumulation model um, should be slower for shorter presentations. So for poorer quality visual short-term memory traces, you're not able to glean as much evidence from these traces, and therefore that process is going to be slower. So the first thing we wanted to do is at least get the description of the choice process in the ABCD task into an evidence accumulation model framework so we can have some way of describing the masking effect in this case. And what we did here is we used what's called a hybrid modeling framework. This is a framework that Andrew, uh, uh, Dora, Charlotte, and Andrew have been uh, actually working with, with some time for some time. Um, and it ended up being really useful um, in this case because it has some really, it has some beneficial features in terms of uh, ease of parameter estimation. Um, and it worked out really well here. So what it basically does, it combines an evidence accumulation model. In this case, we're using what's called a racing walled model that describes go choices with an X Gaussian model of the stop process reaction times. Um, so in the racing walled model, it assumes that the, there's an accumulator for the true response that races an accumulator for the false response towards an upper boundary. Um, and the average rate of accumulation of evidence for each of these responses is determined by two drift rate parameters, a V true parameter and a V false, false parameter respectively. And the idea is simply that in a stop trial um, on this task, there's a third runner that enters the race and that's the stop process, right? And the stop process finishing times are described here by a simple X Gaussian model where mu represents the latency of the distribution of stop process response times. Um, sigma represents the Gaussian variability and tau represents exponential variability. So now that we've got this hybrid model that has the choice process uh, in an evidence accumulation model framework, how do we actually describe the effects of masking? Um, and what we're basically assuming here um, is that on stop trials, we're, we're assuming that the evidence signal is the sum of a discriminative component, um, which is basically just the difference between these V true and V false accumulation rates. So as this component grows, responding is going to get more accurate. Um, and an urgency component, which basically drives evidence accumulation for both of these accumulators equally. And the assumption is that if you start out at zero seconds, there's no discriminative information present. You don't see the choice stimulus at all, so you don't have any kind of discriminative information with which to make your choice. So the only signal that's present is this urgency signal. And then from there, over time, we're assuming that the discriminative component grows at a linear rate, which we're uh, calling parameter k, until v true and v false reach their go trial levels. So functionally, what this means for v true and v false on uh, stop trials is that at V0, they're identical, right? Because there's no kind of preference toward either of the responses. You don't have any information kind of pulling you either way. Um, and then over time, V true grows and V false decreases according to this K parameter um, until it reaches go trial level. So this is how we're able to use information from go trials to at least provide some constraints on um, uh, the uh, drift rates uh, for these stop trials, right? Because they kind of provide the upper and lower bounds at which these can grow to. Um, and we're and in doing so, we only actually need two extra parameters in this model, this V0 urgency parameter and this K parameter um, in order to actually describe performance on these uh, shorter SSD trials where independence is violated. So if you look at, uh, if you fit this model to uh, individuals in the ABCD data set, um, these are the uh, trajectories, uh, kind of empirical trajectories you see in these uh, drift rate parameters. So here we were fitting models uh, to a subset of participants, about 600 uh, kids drawn from six sites. And this is because we're using Bayesian model estimation, which can be um, computationally intensive. So we didn't necessarily want to have to fit to the whole large sample. We kind of use a representative sum sample here. 
And what this plot shows is how the rates of accumulation for the true and the false response grow empirically by SSD um, as described by this model. Um, so the bold lines represent uh, the sort of sample average growth pattern for all 600 participants. And then we have some thin lines of 20 randomly drawn participants to show uh, individual variability. Um, and what you can see is that this seems to indicate that for um, uh, SSD is 300 milliseconds or so and above, most people kind of have uh, drift rates that have reached their grip go trial level. So once you've kind of seen something for about that long, you have a good enough idea of it to uh, basically respond for your response to not be impacted so much by the mass gain anyway. Um, but as it goes down, um, as uh, the SSDs get shorter, uh, there's this pretty dramatic decrease where um, the rate of evidence accumulation for the true response goes down, and even more so, the rate of evidence accumulation for the false response goes up. So how well does this pattern actually do at describing um, this uh, smoking uh, gun plot, right? This, this plot that shows that um, choice accuracy is really degraded on these short SSD trials. Um, so here, um, what I'm showing are in the black dots and black lines. These represent the empirical values of accuracy um, in the subsample um, at, each, at, each, at each SSD. Um, so it shows the growth from chance to about the asymptotic level. Um, and the hollow dots and error bars represent um, the median predictions of our model um, for the dots and the error bars represent 99% credible intervals. So because we're using Bayesian model estimation here, we're able to um, uh, show that there's some uncertainty in our model's predictions, right? That's captured by these error bars. And overall, the model seems to do a very, very good job of describing this trend in accuracy. We actually thought this was pretty interesting. We tried some other parameters other than linear growth. We thought linear, oh, that's too simplistic. There's no way it can capture this clearly nonlinear pattern. It actually does a pretty good job, maybe because it's interacting with some other um, parameters in the model. So just to show you the importance of actually having this kind of growth function, I want you to compare it on the right here to the, um, uh, this is basically an identical hybrid model, except it does not have a growth function. So it does not have a V0 or K parameter, and it therefore assumes that evidence accumulation on all uh, stop trials of all SSDs is identical to how it is on Go trials. So it's assuming you know, their, that context independence is not violated. And you can see here kind of a similar pattern consistent with a lot of the other plots we've looked at, which is that above three or 400 milliseconds, this doesn't seem to be, misfit isn't terribly bad, but then as you go down, you start to see more and more gross patterns of misfit. Um, so this shows the importance of actually accounting for this um, with the growth function. We also looked at some more traditional, uh, kind of more standard trends that seem to be, that are you know, generally present um, across different stop signal tasks, and that, are, uh, that includes the inhibition function. So this is basically a plot that represents um, uh, the increase in an individual's probability for responding as stop signal delays get longer. So as stop signal delays get longer, the task gets more difficult, and therefore you, you uh, expect to see this increasing slope. Um, here we're looking at, um, uh, SSD trials that are binned by in, uh, binned by individuals quintiles. So we're basically accounting for individual dif differences in performance here. So somebody, um, one person might have a lot of trouble inhibiting their response at a 200 millisecond SSD and uh, might have an easier time at 50 milliseconds, right? But a different person might do uh, be pretty good at inhibiting their response at 200 milliseconds. So when you don't look at when you look at kind of the um, when you bin SSDs by kind of absolute um, SSD is across the group. You tend to see the inhibition functions that are fairly flat. And so here we're, we're uh, kind of better accounting for individual variation. And what we see is that the model is able to count to account for this increasing slope fairly well. Um, on the right, we're also looking at signal respond RTs. These are res uh, median response times for when the participant fails to inhibit their response. Um, for this, it makes a little bit more sense to actually look at absolute bins, um, and that's because the main, uh, the reason for this increasing slope is that um, uh, RTs are censored to a lesser extent as the SSD gets longer, right? So you tend to see the slope a little bit better at the group level. And we find that we're not doing a perfect job of describing each individual data point here. We're undershooting the slope a little bit, um, but we're capturing the slope fairly well. So how do, well did we do at this goal? Um, so currently we think our model does provide a, a formal explanation for mas the masking effect on behavior on the Go uh, choice process that is importantly consistent with prior modeling work and prior theories in this computational modeling literature.
Um, it describes this accuracy trend very well. Um, it also describes classic trends pretty well, um, like the inhibition function and the growth in signal respond RTs. One thing I'll note about the, these uh, other trends is that um, because we're fitting in a, a Bayesian framework here, we um, can posit priors about where we think parameter estimates should be. And one, one thing that we realized after fitting these models is that having informed priors, which basically we do by doing a, uh, using a hierarchical fitting method and an independent subset of individuals, um, to obtain prior. So hierarchical modeling is really good at kind of getting that commonalities across people. So you can get some more constrained priors from those fits. Um, so basically taking those parameter estimates and making kind of narrower, tighter priors actually seems to improve the fits uh, uh, to the inhibition function a lot. Um, so we'd recommend um, if we were using this model um, to try and uh, obtain some informative priors. Um, and that's relevant for thinking about what is the impact of this violation on the, uh, uh, according to our model, on the uh, traditional estimates in the ABCD data set. So one thing I'll start with is a bit of good news, and that's that SSRT estimates from our ABCD hybrid model, which can be obtained by just adding the mu and tau parameters together, um, are fairly strongly correlated with the standard horse race estimates in the same participants. Um, the exact character of this relationship differs a little bit by whether you're using broad uninformative priors on the left or using more tight informed priors um, on the right. So on the left, there is a fairly good one-to-one -one correspondence in the absolute values. On the right, there's still a correlation. Um, but if you notice the uh, parameter estimates from our model vary in a much more constrained range. And that's um, basically because of uh, the priors we're using from the hierarchical model kind of restricts uh, the range of variation a little bit. Um, and we think this is a good thing because basically the idea behind using informed priors is that if you don't use them, the other estimates like the ones that left might be a little bit overfit to individual uh, fe features of individuals data, right? So we actually are a fan of these constraints. But regardless, what you see is that um, rank ordering is preserved fairly well. Um, at least if you're willing to view our model as kind of a ground truth or close to ground truth model um, in the horse race estimates. But I also want to note some big cautions here. So that's that, you know, clearly we've, we've added some parameters here to the traditional horse race model to try and explain um, some uh, extra processes, right, that we have to account for in the ABCD test. So it's possible, similar to how trigger failures can uh, affect your conclusions, um, if you don't account for them, it's possible that these other extra processes might um, uh, kind of lead you astray if you're only using the horse race uh, traditional model estimates. Um, and so basically what, what I'm showing here are um, SSRTs from two individuals. So the horizontal red and blue lines represent uh, the actual SSRTs uh, where they are according to our model um, on the y-axis there. Um, and what we've basically done here is we've taken uh, parameter estimates from this individual, and then we systematically varied the V0 parameter, so the parameter for urgency, across a range of plausible values in the data set. Um, and then looked at, so uh, if you're looking at the uh, blue dots and red dots, these basically represent what the, horse, the corresponding horse race model estimates are at these different levels of urgency. Um, and so in the range where the person's parameter estimates actually are, so these X's here on the red, on the red and blue lines represent uh, where V0 actually is according to our model for these two participants. And we chose these two participants because they have different SSRTs, but similar levels of urgency. The horse race model estimates do a pretty good job. You make the correct inference, right? That the red person has a longer SSRT than the blue person. Um, but as you can see, this can vary pretty dramatically um, as a function of urgency, right? And in particular, when you get to very high levels, you can actually make the reverse incorrect inference, right? That the um, person in blue is actually has a longer SSRT. Um, and so we've done some more extensive simulations as well, showing that if you're doing a group difference analysis and SSRT differs between groups, but uh, urgency and some other parameters do as well, um, you could have the similar uh, kind of confounding effect at the group level where you can actually make the wrong, the directionally wrong inference um, if you only look at the horse race estimates. In another example of this, we looked at um, whether you can reverse a relationship with a covariate. So here um, in orange, you see that basically we simulated data where we assumed that SSRT um, from our model was negatively correlated with an external covariate. Um, we also here assumed that that external covariate was confounded with urgency again. 
Um, and so then you can see that when you um, fit the horse race model or yeah, obtain estimates with the horse race model, right, you can, you can actually see a, re a reversed uh, relationship. Um, so these are two examples of basically where you might be doing some uh, substantive relate uh, substantive analyses in the ABCD data set, and this can actually um, uh, cause some uh, pretty systematic problems for the conclusions that you draw. So our process model, we think, generally suggests that rank ordering of SSRT is fairly well preserved in traditional horse race estimates in the data set, but we're showing here with these simulations that unmodeled processes can still be problematic. So the next logical question is, can investigators use our model to obtain accurate estimates of SSRT and other processes of interest um, from the empirical stop signal data in ABCD? And that's a, an important question to ask, because not all process models even process models that do a really good job of describing data, not all of them can be considered measurement models. Um, so in order for a model to be considered uh, adequate for measurement, it basically requires a one-to-one -one mapping between the data generated parameter values and the parameter estimates that you can actually reasonably obtain from the empirical data that you have. And so to determine whether this was the case, we did um, large simulation studies where we took values of parameters from our ABCD model. Um, these values are shown on the x-axis in these plots. Then we simulated a bunch of data sets that all had the same features as data sets of ABCD, so the exact same number of go and stop trials and uh, SSD staircase. Um, and then we tried to see if when we fit the model to those uh, simulated data sets, do we actually get the data generating parameters back? Um, so here we're showing recovery for the walled model parameters for the go choice and the masking effect. We find that we're able to get back um, evidence accumulation rates for the true and false responses really well. Same goes for some of the other walled parameters uh, that are a little bit less relevant for the talk, B and T0. Um, we do less well at recovering V0 and K. And this is not necessarily surprising. These parameters are not constrained by very much information. The other parameters here are constrained by information on the 300 GO trials, right? Whereas K and V0, we have to kind of infer on a limited number of stop trials. Um, so we don't do as good, in, uh, I, I, we're not as good at getting those back. One, uh, a couple of pieces of good news. One is that, you know, there don't appear to be biases. The scatters are pretty well, um, aligned with that uh, line of perfect recovery. So there's definitely some noise there, um, but we're, we seem to be able to get fairly unbiased estimates back. And we're also thinking that these K and V0 parameters are not gonna be of interest to a lot of investigators, right? They're kind of nuisance parameters that you fit because you want to address their impact on uh, the parameters that you're actually interested in. Uh, so in terms of some of those parameters, so here are the X Gaussian parameters, so mu, sigma, and tau for the stop process, and then SSRT, we're able to get those back fairly well, so no real indications of bias here, and about 0.7 for recovery. Um, it's, that's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's at, a, it's at a pretty good level when you consider that there's only about 60 stop trials in this data set. So again, considering the limited information we have, um, we're able to recover these fairly well. We're also able to recover trigger failure um, probabilities um, and go failure um, in the data set also. Um, there's a couple areas of ongoing work that I want to note. So we want to kind of tie up a couple loose ends here. One is that the trigger failure parameter seems to be more sensitive to priors than a lot of the other parameters are. And this is important for us to get on top of because we, you know, although I've shown you we can recover trigger failure pretty well. There, there might be some situations where uh, priors can kind of bias those values away from the data generating parameter value. So we're doing some extra simulations to account for that. The other thing that we actually didn't, uh, we actually didn't notice until recently uh, after looking at the revised version of uh, Patrick's uh, uh, preprint was that there is this slight uptick in probability of responding on zero millisecond SSD trials. Um, so like I said, we, we didn't notice this because we tend to look at inhibition functions by accounting for individual um, performance, right? By kind of binning by individual SSDs. And when you do that, you actually don't see this. When you look at SSDs binned by the absolute values across the whole group, you do see that there's this slight decrease um, as SSDs get lower. And then there's this uptick at zero that our model doesn't do a great job of accounting for. Um, so this is pretty interesting. We think this likely has to do with some kind of contaminant process that's specific to the zero SSD trials. And we're trying to address it in two ways. So we're exploring whether we can uh, use a process explanation. So we're basically adding another trigger failure parameter to account for it. 
Um, and then we're also trying to validate uh, parameter estimation while we just exclude these trials. So can we fit our base model that I've showed you today, um, basically while excluding the around 9% of or so of uh, zero SSD trials. So those um, analyses are kind of ongoing now. Um, and we're fairly confident that since this is a minority of, of trials, that we um, are going to probably be able to recover parameters from our base model fairly well. But we want to do our due diligence here and uh, make sure that that's the case before we actually post a preprint and make some broader claims. So we think that the cognitive process model we developed um, does a pretty good job of explaining the, the impact of, con of the context independence violation, at least on the go process, um, through masking effects on the quality of choice evidence. If you uh, view this model as close to your ground truth model, it suggests that rank ordering of participants by SSRT is generally preserved in horse race model estimates. But we also show in simulations that these estimates uh, that don't account for violations of the model and don't account for other processes can lead to incorrect inferences. What I want to note here, though, is that this is a special case of a more general rule. Other processes that um, aren't accounted for by the standard horse race model, um, like trigger failure, we know can already impact um, inferences in a lot of different data sets. So um, basically, our message here is that you know, you're often going to be better off using a model that accounts for more processes, whether you're doing it in a data set like ABCD or not. And on that note, we are hopeful that our ABCD process model can be used as a measurement model, which would help resolve these issues. Um, just quickly, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the task should be changed. From our perspective, um, if a model like ours, or it doesn't necessarily need to be ours, but if, if work like this can kind of address some of the, um, the issues in the data set, we don't necessarily think that there needs to be um, a, um, a, a complete overhaul of the task. One thing that's been proposed is disallowing zero millisecond SSDs. Uh, we think that that's a pretty good idea um, because uh, like we just talked about, those SSDs are probably going to have some contaminant processes on them. Um, and we don't think that their exclusion is gonna have a major impact on a lot of models. Um, but we uh, wanna double check that first. So I had a couple of questions for the group, but before we go into those, um, are there any other questions that folks have uh, that I see there are some questions in the chat and I'm happy to address those or others that folks have. I have a quick question, Alex, mm -hmm. um, and I'll keep it very brief. First of all, that's a beautiful presentation, just fantastic. And uh, the, um, the reversal of inference that you show um, with uh, the different levels of that urgency parameter in ABCD, yeah. Um, is that unique to the, con does that uh, interact with uh, context independent violation or is that a general feature of stop signal so that, I mean, uh, urgency is not a parameter that is in the horse race. It's that quantity of evidence parameter, right? Right. So, so you may be making a claim very generally about stop signal tasks that you get this reversal depending on uh, different levels of quantity of evidence. I just wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, it could be exactly. Yeah, so um, I think uh, I think that that's absolutely true because if you assume that, so right, like in models, like you're probably thinking of like the LBA, right, where like urgency is kind of a separate parameter, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's plausible that uh, that could cause issues um, kind of across the board. I think one thing that is true though is that. Um, if you just fit a normal wild model, so let's say that there isn't this independence violation, you just fit kind of like the, a typical uh, hybrid model, like, like the one I showed that doesn't account for that slope at all. Um, in theory, that should be able to account for differences in urgency because the because um, basically that's assuming that urgency doesn't change, right, between the go and stop trials. What I will say is that I think you're, you're right in pointing out that um, you know, this is a kind of a, a this is something that, that these kind of trade-offs can happen with a lot of different parameters, right? That may or may not be accounted for in the standard horse race model. Um, and that and that's something that we want to emphasize here is that this is, you know, it's definitely a challenge. Like this is a serious, this is a potentially serious problem. Um, but it's also something that we might have tools um, in the cognitive modeling literature to to address, you know, because they've been addressed before in some ways. I have, a, I have a question if you're still taking audience questions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just being a skeptical curmudgeon, um, I, I think this is great. I, I want to second what Chandra said. I think this is great. But um, have you thought about, um, you know, one of the big 
things for me about stop signal reaction time is that it's this unobserved quantity, which at the end of the day has to be modeled by everything, right? And so we, we, at some level we can start to ask, well, you know, how do we know the ground truth of any of these models? Like, and so therefore I wonder whether we've considered using some of those, uh, I think it was, it might've been Alan Kingstone's group, Patrick would know, um, but there have been groups that have used um, things where like you're, you're using a, a, a pad or something and you can actually measure when people actually stop. So the goal is like move the cursor to someplace on the screen and then the, the bell rings and you see exactly where the cursor is when the person stops. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether how this model that you've come up with here would perform relative to the race model for something like that, where you would actually have the observed stop signal reaction time in every trial and could then, you know, just sort of compare your model to the ground truth. Is that, would that be valuable for this kind of approach or, or do you think it's not necessary? Oh, I think I think it's a really good idea, and I, I think it's valuable, um, certainly valuable in the sense that it's it sounds like a great way of kind of validating any process model of a of the task, you know, for sure. I guess one one limitation of that, I, I'm not too familiar with that literature to be honest, but um, in those kind of paradigms, it, it in some way it is a ground truth, but in some way it's it seems um, there. It doesn't necessarily account like uh, for processes that may occur prior to somebody moving the cursor you know what I mean so there's still there's still there's a process that like the motor response you, it sounds like what you're trying to do is essentially um find the point at which that stops but I, I think there's I think that there's still reason to believe that there there's a portion of those processes that maybe at the beginning of them that is not well measured right and it's probably unmeasurable um I don't know it's a it's a uh, without knowing too much about the literature, those are my, that would be my initial thought, though. Um, but it's a good, um, it's a good point. We don't know. It's not. It's not like a lot of like response time tasks, right? Where it's easy to know the ground. Well, not necessarily easy to know the ground truth. You observe more, right? Where on the stop trials, you're inferring quite a bit. Um, so that that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, some of those folks that use tasks like that have tried to argue that you're getting similar outputs. James Coxon has mm -hmm. focused on tasks like this, but the, the concern is the literature, because Gordon did it this way for 40 years, is, is so dominated by these discrete responses mm -hmm. that there's a skepticism that by doing something continuous that has obvious virtues of getting things like individual trial SSRT estimates yeah. may just be capturing something different. And it and there may just be a mapping, a new kind of mapping problem that it, it, it may be getting a, a measure of something, but by virtue of it being continuous and not being engaged, um, the, the inhibition process may be different. Um, yeah. And, and if I may, I had a couple other um, questions. Or, yeah, please. And thanks for clarifying. I need to, that uh, sounds like a really interesting literature. So. Yeah, it's, it's smaller than perhaps it ought to be. Um, we've started dabbling in it a little bit, but these discrete responses have certainly dominated. Um, yeah, really nice work. I'm, I'm super excited to see lots of meat being put on some of the kind of empirical bones that, that we put out there that we were really hopeful that it would spur modeling efforts. Because I'm, I'm in 100% agreement that the best solution of getting out of this challenge is through, um, is through modeling. And so the, the process model you suggest, the, the process of it is this masking, which I think is really interesting. Um, I really like the idea, but I have you know, a couple concerns about that process. Um, one of them is it's assuming the only thing that's being affected is the go process um, mm -hmm. when, when this masking occurs. And there's some reasons to suggest that maybe that's not the case. Um, I mean, one is, you know, in, in a normal stop signal task, the both stimuli are up for the whole time. Is they're all it's perceptual. It's 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 being driven by a percept. It's it's not a short-term memory or memory challenge at all. And some evidence suggests um, some of Jan Wessel and Adam Aron's work kind of indirectly suggests some data that will be coming out relatively soon with suggests that when you introduce memory challenges to a stop signal test, the stop process itself becomes impaired mm -hmm. as if there's some sort of um, bottleneck 
or um, shared resource demand that or something limited mm -hmm. between um, the go and the stop process that basically when you introduce memory demands, the stop process becomes impaired. Mm -hmm. And so if this is the case, then you would, if the process is essentially making it go from a perceptual task to a memory task mm -hmm. and memory impairs the stop process itself, then this is going to challenge the ground truth of the uh, truth of the SSRT estimates in the model. Um, because the model, to my understanding, isn't, isn't capturing any impairment to the stop process itself as a result of the masking. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, if, if I may go just one more, um, yeah. the, the kind of reversal of inference with the urgency, I thought was a really interesting and really cool result that you showed. But I, I, was, I was kind of surprised at the, the um, the kind of conclusion you seem to draw from it, which, which seemed that kind of most everything was fine. Um, you know, the, the task should be kept the same. You know, the inferences that you draw from it are largely still accurate when what it seems that the urgency signal is likely what's allowing the model to fit the differential degree of violations across folks. Mm -hmm. you know, a strong urgency signal will drive some of these really fast early responses mm -hmm. that we see more so in some people than others. So the urgency signal is this key part of the model that's allowing the violations to be captured, mm -hmm. yet um, inferences can be reversed as a result of um, the, this essentially like the, the, this urgency signal, which, which struck me as potentially relatively deep-rooted challenge. No, so, I mean, it, Oh, sorry. Do you have um, no, no? Just, just any thoughts on those? I'm really excited. To hear. Yeah. So, two thoughts. I guess on the, I'll take the second one first. I mean, so I think um, two points there. One, one is that, and I think this is something to keep in mind. Um, so, just because we show that something can happen, we don't have a good idea of the probability that it will happen, right? And I think it's quite hopeful that you know, about 50% of the variance in uh, horse race SSRTs are explained by uh, the estimates in our model, right? And I think in general, that's a good idea, or sorry, that's a good indication that um, your inferences may not be, may not, may not necessarily be impacted to, uh, uh, in every situation. Now, the, the, the message is not necessarily that everything's fine. It's that basically that, look, there could be some situations that where this will lead you to lead you astray. If you're able to account for those using a process model, it doesn't even necessarily need to be ours. I think what we're showing here is that we can start dabbling in this and start coming up with solutions. Then it, it seems quite likely that some kind of workable solution is going to emerge from this work and other work. Um, and that's kind of the, so the, it's kind of two different points. One is that, you know, this could be problematic. Um, you're, go, you're going to be better off using a model that, uh, accounts for urgency and other processes, right? Um, if I had on a hunch, if I had to bet, I would bet that given the strong correlation in the in the rank ordering, you know, it, it may not be a problem for a lot of inferences, but it might. So it, given that that's true, you should you should use a process model. And then the second point is basically, you know, the um, yeah, the the idea about whether or not the task should be changed is, is not based on the idea that everything is fine. It's based on the idea that this seems like a, an addressable problem uh, to us, or one that it can at least be characterized um, well enough, right, good enough, that uh, um, it doesn't, uh, the trade-off of, of shifting a task design in the middle of a longitudinal study isn't, uh, is, is uh, uh, not warranted, basically. So those are, those are to be a bit more precise about the conclusions there. Um, and then I guess, you, so the, the first concern, that also does make a lot of sense. It, it, it could be that, I mean, in some ways, it, I, I see what you're saying. It might qualitatively change the task and to turn it into a memory task. Uh -huh. But I don't know if that's necessarily what the evidence accumulation models would say. I think, I think uh, evidence accumulation models, uh, what I think is really attractive about them is that they often don't need kind of assumptions about auxiliary processes, right? So it basically just says there's this percept, right? That percept is there, whether you're still looking at the thing or whether it's vanished, right? Um, and the difference is a matter of, of uh, quantity, 
rather than it being a qualitatively different process. So that's kind of what I'd say about that. This is kind of, it may or may not be true, but this is kind of operating the, under the assumption that the task is fundamentally the same, that this is an understandable modulation of rates of evidence accumulation in the context of the model. Uh, it doesn't necessarily qualitatively change the, the task on those trials. That, that would, that's the assumption we're working under anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll, sorry if I may take just a little more time. Um, I'll be interested to see how the model works with the zero SSD issue mm -hmm. is that you, you presumably saw in our most recent preprint that we, we had suggested something that admittedly is, is much less complete than, than what you've done, but essentially suggests that the, the go rate is reduced in a very similar way to, to what, your, um, what your model's suggesting. But the problem is that it, we failed to get it to capture the zero SSDs. We essentially had to assume it was totally different that right. we had to assume that these subjects were just confused. Like the task was so deficient that the <laughs> subjects had no idea what to do with these zero SSDs. Yeah. So, so the drive to both, to both the go and the stop stimuli were suppressed because mm -hmm. these kids were essentially throwing their hands up. They were told they were gonna get a go stimulus and then a stop stimulus. And then on many of these trials, they just got a stop stimulus. So the kids said, well, this isn't a stop signal task. Um, and yeah. and uh, and I think I think that that's I'm, I um, I laud you for your optimism, but um, I certainly see the differences much more saliently than I see the similarities um, between ABCD stopping data and normal stopping data, and um, in some of our attempts to to try to capture it with models just by adjusting something like the Go process if have failed to capture certain features of the data so far. Yeah, no, the, the uptick's important to capture. I, I don't, I definitely don't disagree with that. Um, I mean, and I agree. I mean, it, it's a reasonable explanation to just think on these trials, kids are like, what? Like, oh, I'm like, there's like, I guess I'll respond because I don't yeah. know what to do. And I just see yeah. one arrow, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a totally reasonable explanation. Um, I mean, I guess I, I'd come back to, you know, a lot of models, including evidence accumulation models are pretty robust bust to where little corners of, uh, of, of data tend to be off, right? So I, th that's the thing is like we, um, we're, our optimism comes from the uh, assumption that the majority of people don't have zero SSD trials, right? And most people have only a handful. So if it ends up being really, the, the process ends up being really, really contaminated on those trials, it might limit the sample size, at least for, at least for uh, kids who currently have completed the task. Um, but if, if we can get decent recovery without those trials, it may be good enough. We just say that these, these trials are, are, uh, are weird and they are right <laughs> process explanation or not. Um, but that's kind of, that's where the optimism comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other data points seem to be described well. Mm -hmm. Really cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, your thoughts. I think Pam has been waiting with a question, Pam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alex. This is very good. Uh, it was very hard to break in and try to get a question. Um, so one of the things I've, I've reviewed a lot of the ABCD studies, and I work with uh, a lots of population data sets. And one of the things that I think is um, an ongoing issue is when we take something that's done from the laboratory or from our psych studies, and we bring them up to the population one. So what we're revealing, and that's what's happening with ABCD, lots of things that we thought had really large effect sizes now are finding almost none to zero, right, of processes we thought occurred. And I think the other thing that's occurring is measurements that we thought were good. We are now seeing, because that, I mean, when they got together, they all had experts who put forward what they thought were the best measures, right? These weren't ones that were just randomly selected. They thought this was going to be the best one for this age group in order to get at what they thought they were getting at because it was in the literature. So now what we're finding now that we have large sample sizes to look at, we're able to pull apart some of these issues and be able to model it better. And I, I absolutely agree. Modeling is the way to go because the way that we had used this previously didn't really allow us to even have like a separate ground truth group that we could kind of look at and then like actually estimate the models with. And now we have that. So I think we're gonna see that a lot that, you know, these are homegrown measures. These are something that people created. They don't validate them the way they validate IQ tests or achievement tests that data comes in constantly and you're able to update your, your measurement models. So I think we're gonna have this kind of 
um, oddity as we have, like I'm having this with executive function models that are done differently and measured differently across 20 different data sets. And I'm trying to replicate, but everyone decided to use a different measure because it was their favorite measure to use or somebody else said it was the best one to use. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, is it good or is it not good? I think what you guys are showing is there are ways to model it, to be suspicious, you know, and, and careful about the inferences you make, but that there are ways to think about it differently. And I think that's what you can do until, and, and, and this is going to be an in interesting issue because this is a longitudinal study. Do you change out the measure? Because now if you do, is the difference because you have a different measure or because the children aged and now they're doing something different. And this is a huge developmental question for us that you know I deal with all the time. I don't know if that difference is developmental difference or because you chose a different measure and now it's measuring it differently and, and what a horrible situation to be in. And I actually think the modeling may help us with that, right? We might be able to account for that. Uh, which will be nice. But I, I think that, that it, there's just kind of a bigger question to kind of think about, which is mm -hmm. how do we decide on these measurements? Where do they come from? And then what can we do? Being that someone, someone thought this was the best measure to use for the ABCD study. And now we're finding problems with it because we have the data to find those problems, whereas we didn't previously. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. And, and it brings up a couple of separate issues. I mean, one thing I'll say is is that I think this is, um, uh, but th there's kind of two separate issues here, and both are really really important. And you know, one is the one that, um, what you identify, which is that a lot of, and this is not unique to ABCD, but we're finding that a lot of more like more uh, diverse, large data sets, both in neuroimaging and relating things like cognitive measures to. Uh, things like psychiatric symptoms and the stuff that we're interested in, that those relationships are a lot smaller than we thought that they were, right? And I think that that's a, a really crucial reason to have studies like ABCD because it shows that there's something about maybe our sampling or about the way that we conducted research before that was inflating those estimates. And, and I think that's very, very important. Um, I, I, I think that the um, issue with the ABCD task is kind of another issue on top of that. That is, that is. I mean, this is, the, Patrick is correct to point this out. This is a, a unique um, problem uh, for this task because it was designed in, in such a way that it, it, viola it violates a, a core uh, assumption of the model, right? Um, and I, that, that being said, I, I think it's totally likely that through modeling or through um, just, just a lot of, of research on this task and the sample, um, we're probably going to have a lot of really revised ideas about what these individual difference dimensions of cognition are, right? But it's great because we're finally doing that. It's, it's um, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's really, it's exciting and as exciting as it is, uh, you know, challenging <laughs> and disappointing sometimes, right? Um, but I think yeah, it and us, right? Gives us information. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's a great point. And I think it's important for, for a lot of the students here to recognize um, your framing of it, Pam, was very accurate. It's like, we can find the problems now because we have the data to do it. Um, and that having the large studies, it might not be answering in some ways the questions we set out to answer, or it's not affirming some of the processes we thought were going on. Although, you know, of course, my aside is, well, when you add more pers people, if there's heterogeneity, of course, the relationships are going to be smaller than they are in a smaller, more homogeneous sample. But that's for a different methods hour. Um, the, the point of this one is to say there's a lot of challenges in this, but it's also exciting because it, it really exemplifies how we move the science forward. And I think that's a, a token here that I really want, hopefully, especially the students in the room to to take away from this is, well, we see what the problem is. We got to point out what the problem is. And then we figure out what we can do about it, maybe some differential modeling. And then we have the bigger, you know, um, logistical questions maybe about the science. Well, do we change the measure or not? Now that we know the problem's there, we could we can solve it this way or or we could, you know, consider changing the measure in the future. So that's just the the direction of the science. And I think it's really exciting to, to be on kind of, or hear about those of you on the forefront of this. and. And um, you know, really, really appreciate the presentation and, and conversation today. Um, any any additional questions or comments from the group? <laughs>
I just I'll just add. That was, that was I'm really sorry. Good. Thank, and I appreciate all the questions too, and, and uh, you know, Pam's comments and everything. I, I just, I mean, but that presentation really was um, very clearly done, and I can understand the approach and appreciate it. So, thanks. I, I definitely learned something from today. Thank you. Well, I uh, really appreciate everyone's attention, and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the feedback. Please feel free to reach out to me if you if you got additional thoughts, and uh, yeah, this has been really fun. Wonderful, thank you.